Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a conversation with Floyd Marshall Jr. And I'm your humble host, Floyd Marshall. And tonight we are joined by veteran stage, television, and theater actor, Brian Anthony Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, we affectionately know him as Ba in Philadelphia. And when I say this is one of the most iconic actors out there, that is not an understatement. This brother has been in some of the best television shows, films out there. You probably know him from The Wire as Detective Holly. You've seen him in The Postman, Limitless, Silver Linings Playbook, and so many other uh, iconic films. Brian, Brian, welcome to the show, my brother. How are you? I am blessed to be here, Floyd. Thank you for having me, brother. And I just, uh, oh, man, happy to be here. It's a little, <laughs> I just read about the young brother being okay. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm so happy. That, so that is, happy. that is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Cause I was a little shook, uh, you know, being from Philadelphia and, and seeing him collapse on the field, it took me back to, I think it was 1985 or 86, because I, I attended Dobbins High School. Oh. So when uh, they had the uh, the death of Hank Gathers. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Because he passed right. away on the basketball court. Because that was a cardiac joint. Yeah. Yes. That was the first thing that kept me that, running man. through my he, mind. He, he was so beloved, man. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, brother. I, I played I played football in high school, uh, de defensive uh, tackle, uh, freshman and sophomore year, and I saw a um, documentary about high school high school paraplegics, mm -hmm. and I quit that next season. Um, I was done. I was scared, and I mean, I never. I mean, I was a good football player, but I didn't have that that killer edge and i i never liked playing in in the cold anyway but okay okay that that scared me man and ironically the next season one of the cats on the football team broke his neck wow uh, playing sandlot football but dude white boy but he was so strong i mean he he walked like like with a limp and stuff but he was able to walk again okay because he was that he had built his body up so strong but he still had, you know, like neurological issues. But right, right. Somebody else might have been in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. But, wow, wow. And I was well, like, yeah. wow, that's that was scary. But God, but, thank you, God, thank you. Prayer works. Um, it does. It definitely does. It definitely does. But let's jump right into this. And again, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask a favor of you. If you're if you're listening, if you can put in the comments, if you hear an echo. Please let me know because I am hearing a mad echo in my headphones and I don't know if the uh, audience members can hear that. If the audience members can hear it, that's great. I'll deal with it. <laughs> I'm just hearing myself talk twice. Oh, wow. Um, I, I can't hear it, Floyd, so hopefully they don't either. Right. If, if you guys don't hear it, that's great. If I hear it, I'm talking to myself all the time anyway, so it's just like talking to myself. <laughs> me too. Me too. My wife is like, who are you talking to? I'm like, me. Me. <laughs> See, Chris said he can hear it. Oh, he, oh no. Well, oh, you, know you know what? We're going to have an episode where we can hear me talking twice. I have no idea what's going on, ladies and gentlemen. We'll work out the technical issues later, but it is what it is, and we're going in. Uh, you so get, Brian, you get double the Floyd, double the Floyd today. So it is what it is. I, I don't know what's going on. I'll just have to figure. I'll have to figure it out. But um, how did you get started in the business? I'll tell you, Floyd. I, I well, I still sing. I'm a singer. My daddy, God rest his soul, was a singer. Beautiful tenor voice. I used to sing with this uh, uh, R&B band in the late late '80s, early '90s called Perfect Blend, and uh, I wanted to improve my voice, so I heard about Freedom Theater. So I went down there and I took uh, I took a six week course, and as as part of the course for singers, you still had to take a movement class and an acting class, and uh, and it culminated in a in a um, showcase. At the end of that, I was like, man, I like this acting thing. So I went back the next semester as an acting major, and I was in class for two weeks, and um, I got thrown into a play, not because I was great or anything, but because they had fired two people 
And um, I was in a play before I even saw a play, so it was it was bizarre, called uh, On Flower Street, written by the magnificent uh, Millicent Sparks, starring Johnny Hobbs Jr. And uh, he was my mentor, and it was on the job training, man. Uh, John E. Allen, the late great John E. Allen Jr., directed it. And um, it was just on the job training, man. And, and after that, I was hooked. When I heard, when I first heard the audience respond, you know, laughter and stuff, I was hooked, man. And uh, that's how I started back in 1984, I believe. Okay. okay. So, 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 so after, after that, that, did you did you then begin did, formal training? Because I know you said you were you were training there, but did you you just dove in head first as far as all of the the formal training? Yeah, I mean, because I mean, at that point, I was only studying at Freedom, you know, um, because I, I was new to it. And um, and then, you know, eventually I took classes in different places, different theaters, you know, Arden and Walnut and studied in, uh, some uh, film and theater. I mean, film and um, TV stuff up in New York, uh, various places, but nothing, nothing formal. I didn't go to school for it as far as, uh, you know, university or whatever. When I, I went to Millersville University, but I never graduated. But I was an art biology major there. But at the time, I didn't know I wanted to be an actor. If, had I known, maybe I would have graduated. But I didn't take my first class till I was yeah, 20, 23 or 24. Yeah. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. So, so, so after, after working, working in, 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 in and being trained in theater, theater. How did, how did you end up in film? <laughs> it's the same thing that happened, man. Another on-the-job training thing. My agent, who is now retired, Bernard Liebhaber, uh, got an audition for a fair-skinned black man um, for this film, The Postman. So this is how long ago it was. My, you know, Mike Lemon, God rest his soul, he did me a favor and put... Uh, my character only had six lines. Hmm. It was two quick scenes. He put them on tape for me, on VHS tape. So I had to tape it, uh, and then I had to FedEx it, the VHS tape out to California, <laughs> and uh, I got a I got a call from my agent the next day saying the producers like you, they're gonna fly you out to uh, on, on uh, to the location. They were shooting in Tucson, Arizona, so I flew out the next day, and they said you're gonna meet with Kevin Costner. If he likes you, be prepared to stay. If not, you'll be on the next flight back to Philadelphia. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I get there. Um, Costner was out scouting locations, but they told me to wait in this office until he got back. So right before I went in the office, there was a uh, a number above the door, which was 222, hmm. which is my birthday, February 22nd. So I was like, oh, that's a good omen. So Costner gets there. Uh, I was in the, in the office, just he and I alone. We talked about the script, my lack of, of uh, film experience, only the theater act. and um, talked about maybe 15 minutes, and he offered me the part right there. It was just surreal, and that's how I got in my first film. It was an $80 million budget back in 1997, which is probably probably about 150, 180 at this point, uh, in, in today's dollars. I don't know how that translates, but I mean, it was one of the last because he uh, he wrote it, directed it, produced it, starred in it. It's one of the last times the studio, I think, let an actor have that much power. But it was at the height of his powers because he had, uh, you know, he had, he won an Oscar for Dances with Wolves, and uh, he kind of took over Waterworld. People say Waterworld was a flop, but it actually made a hundred million dollars. So I'll take that kind of flop anytime. Unfortunately, The Postman was a flop. Uh, you know, it only made like eighteen million dollars. But you know, but it's a cult film, and people, people really. I, I, met people that really love it especially uh like a lot of latino people latino people seem to uh enjoy it a lot but mm -hmm. i knew when we were making it people were either going to love it or hate it and i think had it come out post 9 11 it would have done a lot better because it was so patriotic mm -hmm. and um you know it's it's i mean it's gorgeous cinematography and you know it's probably a little long but i, I i'm proud to be in it and um and I, I will always be indebted to Kevin Costner for giving me my, my start in film. And he was very generous with screen time and just, uh, just I'm always for, forever indebted to him. Well, you know what? I like uh, post-apocalyptic films. So I, I love it. I love it. You know what the funny thing is, Floyd? The, the year 
that we were supposed to be in <laughs> was 2013. So we're way past that post-apocalyptic era. You know, we made it in 97. It was supposed to be 2013. This was post, you know, the, a big nuclear reaction or whatever. And uh, now we're like, what? What's that? Nine years past? No, yeah, 10 years mm -hmm. past um, the actual, you know, the time that the movie was set in. And, wow. and it, I have to actually have a copy of the book. It was based on a, a, a book, and I met that the author was there on set. I got him to David Brin, I think. Now he got, I got him to sign my book for me, too. So, so what times. was it like sitting in the sitting office, in the office. Talking, talking with, with Kevin Costner? Floyd, it was surreal, man. I, I was like, I had to pinch myself because, I, you know, this guy is an icon. And I'm just this little nobody theater actor from Philly. And um, I think what happened was they must have had, they must have hired somebody, somebody else, and they lost them. But with, for whatever reason, I was there and mm -hmm. God put me there. And uh, it just was, I was just trying to not to hyperventilate and just try <laughs> to sit there and listen and act like I knew what I was talking about, which I didn't because I, I mean, even though I was a big film buff and a person, you know, before the pandemic, I would be in a movie theater three, four times a week, you know, and I still, you know, now I uh, don't go as much now, but, you know, but I, I just had no film experience. But, you know, I knew in my heart I was a good actor and mm -hmm. um, and a fast learner, too. You know, I'm a quick study. So um, and my character only had six lines, but I had a lot of screen time. So it just was. Um, I just, you know, I read the script on the way out, and I, I told him my thoughts about the script and about the character, because my character Woody was like this stoic, you know, didn't say much, but he was, you know, a sincere person. He got conscripted into this army along with Kevin Costner's character, you know, and that's part of the storyline. Hmm. And then my character dies, saving Costner, and enables him to become the postman. But, um. Yeah, it was just surreal, man. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't believe it, and I just was trying to keep keep my head about me, and uh, you know, talk to this Hollywood icon, and um, and and try to convince him <laughs> that I was the right guy for the part. But uh, I think he kind of knew when he flew me out there, but he wanted to meet me in person and, and make sure. So uh, it was just, um, you know, the the biggest event of my. Um, theatrical life you know or artistic life yeah wow but, um yeah it just was surreal man and wow. um i just learned so much and i was like a you know just trying to absorb everything and another smart thing that costner did was he invited me to the um uh oh went out of my head the uh dailies you know because they, he had the uh, camera crew they put me in some outfit and uh, they wanted to check on my complexion and stuff on film. And they had me go through a gamut of emotions and have me running and do some other stuff. And then I could see, I was like, and then they, and then they showed it back to me and, and I could see, oh, wow, I was being too big because I was a mm. theater actor. I, didn't, I had no film experience. And so it just, it was like on the job training, like, okay, I got to bring that in. I got to, you know, pull it in and just not be so expressive with my, you know, face, because, you, you know, it's translating to 45 feet, you know, as opposed to, you know, when you're doing theater, you're trying to reach the back of the house. But um, so it was just, it was smart of him and uh, to invite me to do that, because that was, that was my first film lesson. Um, you know, just watching the dailies and like seeing, okay, no, that's not going to work. I got to bring it in. So, and because uh, I got very little direction on set. And it was funny because when we would shoot my scene, a lot of times it would be, we were losing light, which you know as a filmmaker, it, and once the light goes, that's it. And mm -hmm. I would have like one or two takes to get it. And luckily I was, you know, I was a pretty quick study. And um, and I and I learned about, um, you know, with the script supervisor there too, just about trying to do things the same way as you did them, you know, for uh, continuity. And that was my first lesson in continuity too. You know, so so yeah, not so only did you get a great role, you got some master classes along the way as well. Yes, and just watching, you know, Costner work and direct and 
And, um, you know, Will Patton, who I'm a big fan of, his work, he's, he's a very subtle actor. Joe Santos, who's passed away now, but he was on the Rockford Files. And James Russo, who's this amazing character actor who I've worked with a couple times now, befriended me. And he's one of my only Hollywood friends. Matter of fact, I got to call him for Christmas. I meant to call him. He was he, he played um, Eddie Murphy's best friend and uh in uh, the first um, Beverly Hills Cop, and he's been in a bunch of stuff. Donnie Brasco, and he's got like 270 credits, something crazy on IMDb if you look him up. But And he's funny as hell. He does the, all these impressions of because uh, he worked with uh, Pacino and, and De Niro. Yeah, so he he's a funny dude. But, yeah, it just was, um, God, I, I can't express how amazing an experience it was. And just to, and then, you know, and, and then I got a quick lesson in the biz because my next film after this, you know, $80 million budget being flown out, first class, put up and given per diem and all that stuff. My next film was a film in New York where I slept on the director's floor for like five days. I ended up buying the crew donuts because they didn't have any money. But I was like, oh, this is how it is, right? Okay. And I was playing a, a child molester. It was crazy. But um, it's a movie called Shorties. I was like this real nasty guy. And I ended up getting killed by my kids who, you know, <laughs> one of which is my daughter who I molested. So it's like, wow. wow. But um, it was a quick lesson in the biz. It's like, okay, <laughs> this is, it's, you know, because your first film is this, you know, big budget thing. And then it's like more of what I do most of is indie films, you know, mm. which is, you know, what I've, I've done the majority of. Uh, so I'm, I think I have about almost 200 credits, but it's mostly, you know, indie films, a few TV shows, but uh, and a few blockbusters, but very few of those. Wow. wow. That kind of reminds me of... Uh, uh, when I first started acting, my first commercial was in Westchester, New York. Oh. And when we went up there, the set was absolutely amazing. The craft services were crazy. And I'm thinking, okay, I could do this. And then the very next one, plastic containers. So I'm... I'm box like, lunches, right? Yeah, I said. So wait a minute. We here, and now we're here. That that's it, brother. But but, but, but that's the that's business. The but that that leads me to my next question because with you working on the Postman, that was your first film. So what what are some of the pitfalls in the industry to working if you don't have representation? Because I don't know if you have representation at that moment. Um, I did. Or is it important? Okay, you did. Yeah, I mean, that's the only way I would have gotten access to some a role that juicy and that big. I mean, and the reality is, you know, we can, as, as a, you know, independent artists or whatever, if you don't have an agent, we can submit via, you know, Actors Access and Backstage and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Most of that stuff is going to be low budget. You know, if you want to really get on, like, the, the guest star or a TV show or a recurring star or whatever, um, or, or in a big budget film, you need an agent. I mean, for the most part, I mean, it's very, very rare that they, they might put something out on actors access, but for the big stuff, you you have to have representation. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, I mean, and the other thing is sometimes people will see you in an indie film and, and maybe, you know, reach out, but 99% of the time is, is through agent submission, you know, I would like to say it's something other than that, but it's it's not. I mean, unless you know somebody, if you know a producer or something, and then they bring you in. You know, the way Hollywood works is kind of, um, they, they, they do a lot of package stuff. Like, uh, you know, there's four or five actors who are with the same agency, and they'll say, hey, if you want so-and-so, you got to hire these other three actors, too. And so they don't even have to read, you know. I mean, I know actors who are offer only, which I would... You know, and I've been asked that before, but it's like, I, I, I like to read. I don't care. You know, I have no problem with reading. And um, I think, you know, some of the people who are offer only miss out on a lot of stuff, which um, I can't afford to do. I'm a black actor of a certain age. I'm going to read for what I got to read for, you know. But, yeah, you, you do. And it's funny. I, right now I don't have an agent because the agency I was with, who I, I booked some nice stuff with them over the course of, like, six months. But then... I needed to get, I'm recovering from my, getting my hip replaced and I needed to do theater in order to get my health insurance weeks because I usually don't make enough from SAG after for their insurance. So I get my insurance through theater work, Actors Equity. 
And so the agency I was with dropped me because they said, because I, I had to pass up on some really juicy, um, some really juicy parts. And I, and I, well, and they did, I did get cast in that, uh, it's a new LeBron James uh, limited series called Shooting Stars. And I was cast as one of the, it's about LeBron and four of his teammates in high school. And I was cast as one of the um, fathers of the boys. So I was, it was a five week contract. It was going to be my biggest contract since the postman and <laughs> bad luck happened. I was, I was in uh, Indianapolis doing a world premiere of a play, the reclamation of Madison Hemings playing. It was a two hander about, I was playing Madison Hemings, uh, the illegitimate son of Sally Hemings and, um, and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, I, I came home that Sunday Monday, I was supposed to fly out to Cleveland for five weeks, and I tested positive that day. I was like, why is my throat scratchy? And it was like, mm. really? And it was just really bad luck, but five-week gig, canceled. Um, they did actually have me back for a smaller part. They kept trying to bring me out, which was, I really appreciated that. So I ended up playing the sportscaster, but, um, you know, but it was just pure bad luck. But it was just like, you know, sometimes God will say, hey. That, that was somebody else's blessing to have. So God bless the brother who ever got it. And um, I appreciate the director still trying to have me out there. And, and he did have me out there and uh, for a smaller role. But, hmm. um, yeah, man. So, 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 so how do you prepare for your auditions? What's, what's your process like? I'm very uh, instinctual. And it's just at this point, you know, I've read thousands of scripts. And, uh, you know, you got to you got to break down the thing, break down the scene and, and depending on, you know, kind of get a quick glimpse of who your character is. What, what are you doing? What is your purpose? Because a lot of times when you, you know, and at this point I, I really shouldn't be, uh, I shouldn't say shouldn't be, but I should be beyond reading for the little two line things. But guess what? If somebody's going to pay me 1100 bucks for eight hours a day, as opposed to what I get for theater, <laughs> that's that's more than I make in two weeks sometimes so mm. but I'm going to do it because I got bills to pay I got a kid in school but I you know and I've and I've done uh, guest stars I've done recurring guest stars but as a black actor guess what um you know and I'm not you know I'm not a known entity so if somebody wants me to read for a two-line part guess what I'm going to read for it because I need to work I like to work um, and, uh, you know, it's all about building those credits and it's, what have you done lately? So, but, um, yeah, so it's, and it's just, uh, you know, looking at the script and breaking it down and, and, you know, what is my character doing? What do I want? What am I trying to get in the scene? Um, what are my obstacles and just trying to be as real with it and, you know, and cause you got a hundred other people reading for this thing, you know, and trying to figure out a way to stand out. Um, which is hard to do, you know, and it's because you don't want to be too big with it and you don't want to be, um, you know, too, uh, not, not engaged either. So it's, it's a tricky balance, but it's, it's more about just having that, you know, I've been doing this 35 plus years now. So, I mean, film TV stuff less, but about, you know, 20 some years, but, uh, it's, um, yes, it's a, it's a tricky balance, man. But it's, you know, using the training that I have and, and just breaking down a script and, and just giving my, just being as honest as I can in front of that camera. And, uh, you know, and then, and, and the thing is getting it done quick too, because sometimes it's just like, all right, we need this by five. Mm. Like, really? And then, you know, now we're in pilot season, not that that's affecting me because I don't have an agent right now, but I've seen people doing like five, five in a day. You know, so um, I haven't done that in a bit, but that's that's a bit challenging, too, because it's just like you don't you don't have a whole lot of time for quality control. But you got to be as good as you can be, because the reality is most of these people, they want to see you performance ready. Like it's like I just got this thing, you know, give me a chance, but you don't have a chance. It's just like and a lot of that's why they also want to see you're real, too, because a lot of times it's like, all right we may not see everything we, we, we want to see in this audition, but if I can see a past body of work and I know what this person is capable of, then we, we have an idea about that too. Because sometimes, I mean, it's not just about your audition because a lot of times they want to see you're real and see what else you've done. 
and see what you're capable of doing. Hmm. So, you know, and, 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 and I'm bad about that because, you know, I should have a website up, which I don't, which can really be helpful for, for producers. Cause that, that, that gives them an over a, a great, and sometimes, I mean, it, it's, it's weird. It can be, it can work to <laughs> work to your deficit sometime because if somebody sees that you have this range that you can do, you know, comedy, Shakespeare, drama, whatever, they get a little confused because Hollywood loves to type you. You know, I'm a big black dude. I'm 6'3". You know, I'm under 300 pounds, thank God for now. But I lost some weight. But, um, you know, most of the time I'm going to be a cop. I'm going to be a prisoner. I'm going to, you know, even though I'm capable and I, I played on stage uh, Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice. I've played bank presidents. I've played doctors and lawyers. But, you know, for the most part, film and TV is going to typecast you. Um, unless you, you get some type of notoriety, then, cause I know brothers who have, you know, brothers, brothers and sisters who have gotten their own production companies, then they can produce their own content and they're not limited to what, you know, some casting directors do. And I, I've been blessed that, you know, Harry Loftus casting in Philly, they, they know what I can do and they'll bring me in for different, you know, they, they'll bring me in for a college professor, even though I'm a big, you know, I'm a big burly dude, mm -hmm. but there are big burly college professors. There are big burly bank presidents and doctors, you know, my doctor that I see now, this brother, he's like six, four, you know, not as chunky as me, but mm -hmm. you know, he's a big brother, but he, he's a doctor. He's an orthopedic doctor. So it's, we're out there, but it's just about getting past those stereotypes, which is hard, easier said than done with, a, with some casting directors. So, so with, with that, that with, with you having, having the two liners, two liners do you give all of your characters a backstory, even the characters that only have two lines? Is there a backstory when you're going into the audition and then after you book the role on, on I mean, the set? I, I try to get as much information as I can from the script and from, you know, from a writer. I mean, if it's a TV thing, they're not going to give you much. It's like, I'll give you an example, too. Uh, with my character... Uh, my I had a recurring guest star role on Siren. It was a uh, a TV show. I mean, it's canceled now. It was on for three seasons, but I was only in like three or four episodes. Uh, but um, but it was a division of uh, Disney, so they had a lot of money. They poured into. We shot it up in Vancouver, British Columbia, and um, and it was it was sad to me because I, I watched because my character gets killed off, and um, I watched the wake they had for me for my character because they they asked me for some uh pictures and actual pictures of my family which they used in the in the when they were showing you know my funeral or whatever and i learned more about my character at the wake than i did know beforehand which was i mean but i mean it pissed me off but it it told me that the producers were just looking at my character as a my character was just like a a piece to get my give my son angst and you know and drive him or whatever you know it, it never really thought of my character as somebody substantial or whatever but it was like why wouldn't you give me that information so i could play my character to the fullest of my ability if I, it was like man I, I would have loved to have known that like it's like why wouldn't you tell my me that beforehand why am i finding this out after my character's dead so there's sometimes um i mean i try to come up with a backstory yes even with a two-liner thing, but it, honestly, uh, when it's that, when when you have a two-liner, you're usually just moving the story forward. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's I think it's brilliant, and I like uh, this brother Forrest McClendon, uh, one of the best actors I know. Uh, he was just on Broadway and Thoughts of a Colored Man. Um, he has a whole list of uh, of things about. All right, what is this character? Uh, what does he read? What music does he listen to? Um, does he have any children? How long has he been married? You know, all this stuff. So it, it, it is great to have that. And I do have those tools in my um, repertoire, but sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. But again, um, I mean, not that that's an excuse, but I, I am a, a veteran actor and I, I do rely on my instincts a lot and just and, and just making sure that I am as believable as I can be in front of that camera or, or on that stage for whatever character I'm playing. Hmm. But it is ideal that you have, and and I and I work with uh, especially a lot of indie filmmakers 
who have these intricate backstories for their characters. And I'm like, hey, give it to me. I'll, I'll use all that. Right. So right. sometimes you get it from the writer, director. Sometimes you don't. But um, most of the, the writer, director of indies that I've worked with, they have that, these great backstories that are, the, you know, that are, that's, that's, that's heroin for an actor. I mean, you, you want that. That's, that, that makes my job easier. And, it, you know, it makes, you know, makes the character more believable. But, um, yeah, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Yeah, because I mean, to think about, you know, what, what you've been talking about with Siren, and maybe if they had given you that information for the backstory, it would have made the relationship with you and your son, because if it was antagonistic, there would may, may have been more meat. Yeah, that. and it and it was, and I, it, it was, you know, I was having problems with his mother, which I didn't know really until after the fact. You know, but this, but but it's it just shows you what the producers were thinking that I, my character was a throw off. He was just being used in order to propel my son's storyline, which okay, but but why not give me the even though even though you 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 know you, you're planning on and and it was a, it was funny though because the producers, I I knew uh, because I was we we were hanging out you know because we were shooting the pilot before it got picked up and. Um, you know, somebody got drunk one night and told me, hey, they're going to kill you off. I'm like, really? And and the producers, I don't think they, I, they didn't know. I knew. But I knew once it got picked up and they brought me back, I knew my my time was finite. But, and they, you know, and then they, they presented the script when I get killed and like, like I was going to be surprised. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I acted surprised, but I already knew. I knew six months before that. But, you know. But it, it just it just it, it saddened me. It's just like get, why why would you limit my potential to 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 be as real as I can be? Give me all the juice, all the information that I need. But sometimes, I mean, and I've read that that happens with series because they don't know at the at the time they're still developing some stuff. But I think they 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 knew that part ahead of time. But I think they did. But I don't know. That, that just kind of pissed me off. But. But again, it it, it might have been they didn't discover it till later either. So sometimes mm. it, when they're writing, you know, I know, well, you know, because you're a writer too, that um, and I, and I know writers who are like that just did this thing where they we had like eight, we had eight hours worth of stuff, of of character um development and and eight different episodes written, which they say you should have at least about six to eight, if you're presenting like a um. A series or whatever, so they so the producers can see what the arc of the story is and all that. So, yeah, and, and it's so sad because withholding that information, you're kind of doing a disservice to the audience. I thought so. I mean, would it? I don't know. I came up with some stuff on my own, but yeah, it would have been nice to have that information. That's you know. But again, you know, you know, and I'm as I'm thinking about it again. They they may not have had it at the time, you know, when they shot. Cause I, yeah, I was in the pilot, and then episode two and seven or something, and then I get killed in eight or something, and that's when my whatever wake is. And it's like, wow, it was just, it was just some really juicy stuff that I could have used. It, it it just uh. Oh well, but, but it is it is, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, it, it was it was one of you know one of the another you know, and again that that shows you in this business that was probably twenty years after the postman. So you you rarely get these things where they you know they fly you out first class and put you up in this fancy hotel. Matter of fact, the hotel I was in, uh, I was shooting until like five five a.m. one night at morning. And I came in and I see Robin Gibbons coming out. She's going to catch a plane back to L.A. And I was like, oh, Miss Gibbons, how you doing? I'm a big fan. And she was very, very gracious and, and looked damn good for like 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, too, <laughs> with, no, with no makeup on. She's still fine. And she was very gracious. But it's like I was, yeah, because I, I, I ran into a couple people. Like, a couple people from Star Trek were in there. So it was like it's really nice. It's Sutton Hotel in, in Vancouver. It's like this high-end hotel. And I was like, wow. You know, but I mean, that's the rare, that's the rarity. Most of the time you, you know, you, you stopping at McDonald's for breakfast on the way to set, <laughs> you know, but 
that's that's all right with me. That's that's cool. I, I'll take the the high end and the and the you know the the lower budget too because it's yeah. about the, it's about the work. I mean, of course, you know we 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 want we we like those higher paying uh <laughs> higher paying gigs, but you know I've done some stuff that's you know one of the best roles I've ever had was an indie film when I was playing the lead. Um, you know, one of the best scripts I've ever read. So, uh, and, um, and that was like, you know, minimum pay. But uh, the reward was great because it was one of the nastiest, grittiest characters I've ever played. Hmm. So let's 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 talk about you. You've played the indie film, and you played major Hollywood, but you've also played some very classical characters normally portrayed by white males right so so how did you approach those roles and did it require a major mind shift in those roles again were normally reserved for white males you know the diary of anne frank um king lear things was like like that but before you answer that question yes rachel said what film was that where you played the gritty nasty person oh god you know what i was saying that and then i was trying to remember the darn name of it um my character was named with Warren, and in the first, my first scene, I punch a, I punch a girl in the face. That's how nasty this guy was. <laughs> and it was, it was in front of the Rizzo uh, mural in South Philly. Um, oh Lord, I can't think of the name of it right now. I'll, I'll think of it, but I'll tell her before we end. It's just on the tip of my tongue. I know the character's name was Warren because it's available. I know it's. Uh, uh, matter of fact, I'll, I'll get a link to you, but um. Oh my God, I can't think of the name of it right now, but I'll I'll find it. Rachel, we are going to get you that information. We'll get you. We'll get you. Get it to you. I have to find an old old uh, an old resume. It's on there. But um, but yeah, but go ahead. I'll and I'll find it before we finish. Darn. Okay. Probably got it in here somewhere. <laughs> it's hang. It's hanging around. But yeah, back to the the the, the, the question of you playing classical characters normally reserved for white males what what was the the preparation for that and and especially a, a role like the diary of anne frank yeah i, heard, I played herman von don in that so i mean the reality is there are black jews um mm -hmm. you know but uh, we had a really great um dramaturg uh, Gina up at People's Light. So we got all the information. We actually took a trip to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., which was very informative. And, uh, you know, uh, we had two people in our cast who were Jewish. And uh, Melanie is a black woman. She was playing my wife. She's married to a Jewish man, uh, David, a wonderful actor. And they raised their children as Jewish. But um, so we, it was very authentic in that way. And it's just about finding the humanity of that person. Because, yeah, you look at me. I mean, well, some people think I'm white. It's funny. I did this commercial for the, the lottery one time. I mean, one of the few commercials I've done. And my cousin saw it. And she was like, said to my mom, Bert, I saw this white man that looked just like Brian. <laughs> it's like, you my cousin. You didn't know that was me? I mean, I get pale in the winter. But, you know, because I people think I'm white sometime anyway. But anyway. I got the heart of a Wakandian warrior, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's just about finding the humanity of that person and the and 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 just playing it as, as real as I can, you know, because I am a black male, and uh, and I and, and uh, but our director was just like more life, you know, bring it to life, you know, live in that circumstance, and that's that's the reality, of, you know, that that tight little space that they were in was the reality of their of their circumstance. And just you know playing the character as it is and it's like my, my boy wendell who i just saw uh well a couple months ago now in death of a salesman in that you're talking about classic arthur miller which we also and that's another thing i did up at people's light but um and wendell was brilliant and he they didn't change they didn't alter anything and it's just it goes to show you that we are capable of this 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 brilliance if you give us a chance and i know this matter of fact i was offered a, a, not that not willie loman but there was a production uh, in Arkansas from this sister that I work with in um, St. Louis with, along with, uh, uh, oh Lord. Uh, but anyway, um, 
offered me a smaller role in, in a production of Death of a Salesman, a black production of it. Uh, but it was a conflict with the Royale, which I just finished. So I couldn't take it. But but Wendell doing this role is going to open it up for a lot of people. And I, th I would love to be able to portray that role somewhere sometime, which I think will be available now because Wendell was just so brilliant in it. And uh, hey, Andre the Shields, too. But um, but yeah, so that and, uh, you know, King Lear, which uh, was uh, a challenge. And, you know, um, Dan Kern asked me to do that. And uh, it, it, it kicked my butt, but in a great way. And um, it's just, it, it, he can be black. I mean, not, I'm sorry, not Lear. I, I didn't play Lear. Uh, Titus Andronicus, I played the title role in that. And, you know, Titus, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's not... Well, I mean, of course, I'm sure Shakespeare didn't never expected a black man to be playing Titus, but it's Shakespeare and it's he's a warrior and, and he's he has sons. So that could be anybody. So it depends on who's casting it and who's, you know, producing it is uh, we we are capable of doing so many things. And it, it and it I guess it all it also makes me think about what I want to see or, or could a white man play Troy Maxson? I don't know because it's written to be a black man with all the, the trials and tribulations that he's going through. So I, I don't know how that would work and how I would feel about that. You know, because there was a production of The Mountaintop, I think, where they had two actors. One was white and one was black, a white mm -hmm. man playing Martin Luther King. And it's like, mm, I don't know. But I wouldn't pass judgment on it until I saw it. But yeah, I think it's uh and that's in a way i think that's what's what's given some white actors um you know a, a head up on us because they they've gotten to play these um iconic roles you know and uh and that's another thing we did up at people's light too which uh, you know people's light and arden are i i, I have my 1812 i admire that they 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 They've been doing colorblind casting for years, and I've, mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to play a lot of different roles that at some theater companies, I won't mention any names, but they wouldn't because of the color of my skin or, or, or my ethnicity. But um, we did uh, uh, we did Fences up there, and then they brought back five of the main characters to play these similar characters in All My Sons. So, like, the guy... Um, who played Troy, played the, the father, the lead, and Melanie played the mother, and the same guy played the son, and I played the doctor. Joy Lett, who unfortunately just passed, played my wife. And um, yeah, so, and that was a, a classic, you know, Arthur Miller play that they cast with people, all people of color, and uh, so a, a couple of Latino actors. So, um, but yeah, so, and I think it just... It, it, it expands the theatrical horizon and, and 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 lets people see us in a different light, us as a people, and and show that we're capable of anything. And and, and it can expand that theatrical horizon of of, of individuality. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, to well, use, well, anyway. no, that, that, that's a good word. But here's the interesting thing. If you've watched film for a while and you've watched older films yeah, I love older films. for years, you had white actors playing Indians, Africans, playing every nationality except their own. Right. Fast forward to Rudy, right. Asian, mm -hmm. which we've got in uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah. Yeah. But, but fast forward where that is switched and now all of a sudden well i don't know if they can pull that off but watch us <laughs> people of color had to endure white actors and i i'll, I'll just give an example one movie that i absolutely love is cleopatra with uh elizabeth taylor and richard Burton. Yeah. absolutely love that movie it's not historically correct Good movie. So why why can't that be flipped to the other side if it was okay for Hollywood to, for years to have, again, white actors portraying actors of color? What's the problem now? And again, it's a situation, it's a circumstance that you can insert anyone in, you know, regardless of their color. You know, the diary of an Anne Frank, 
yes, it is it about, is about a, a particular family in, in the Warsaw ghetto, but that could be anybody's family. You know, so let me get off yeah, my and, I, I, and, and what another thing I liked about that was it made me um, understand the plight of, of the Jewish people in, in that circumstance. And I also think it humanized, not humanized, um, well, I mean, definitely humanized, but it, it made it more accessible for these younger students, especially students of color who were coming mm -hmm. to see this story. And it's like, I don't know if I can relate to it, but maybe since they're seeing a black person portraying a Jewish person, which there, again, there are black Jews, it, 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 it made it more accessible for them, you know, and especially since there are some schools now that some kids don't even know what the Holocaust was. You know, so it's, it's, I think it was very important to do that. And, and it, um, it just broadened the horizon for that. And I think it, 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 it made people understand, some people that, especially younger people, understand what the Jewish people went through during that horrible period of time. You're absolutely, You're absolutely right. right. You're absolutely, You're absolutely right. right. And, and we, we, we've been talking about it a little bit, bit but I want to dive in it a little bit more. more. The theater, theater industry, industry in Philadelphia, Philadelphia for performers of, of color. color. <laughs> what has that experience been like, and could, and it, could be it be better? better? Oh, of course it could be better, man. I mean, and things have gotten a bit better, you know, you know, especially after my brother George Floyd was killed and Breonna Taylor, and you know. Of course, they, they're going back to the way they, they were, too. But some theaters got the message. And the thing is, uh, with, um, you know, like I said, some theaters have already been ahead of the, the, the game with uh, colorblind casting. But the other thing is getting people of color into the administration part, too. Because most of these theaters I work with, they're, you know, I, I, I don't see a whole lot of people that look like me. In, in the in administration part, um, they, they, they're doing great with, um, you know, hiring people of color and, and having, um, you know, I, one show I just saw had, it was more more people of color than it was white folks. And it's mm. just like, and I, you know, it's like, I don't want to take somebody's job just because I'm black. I, I want to, you know, and I, I did this, um, I'll just give you an example, this, this short film, but it, it was like a, kind of looked like a little rom-com. And I and it was written by a white dude, and I was and I thanked him. I was like, "Hey, man, thank you for for doing this. You know, writing this, you know, for us." And he was like, "Oh, I just cast the best actors. It just happened to be black." And I was like, "Oh, okay," I, and uh, which which is a wonderful thing. I didn't I didn't know that. And um, he just said, and it was myself and this this uh, black woman. And he just said, I cast the best actors. It wasn't written specifically for black actors. So, and I think that's a great place to get to too. But um, yeah, it's, 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 well, first of all, Philly, Philly theater is very, very cliquish. Um, there's a lot of people who work, uh, same people to work all the time, I think. I, I, and hey, I'm probably guilty of that too. But, um, which is why I love what Theater in the X does. And, uh, you know, and Mama Z's theater, First World Theater Ensemble, you know, they, they're given opportunity. Because it's like, I've been in this business for, you know, 35 plus years. And I, these actors that I, I, I that I saw in Dream Girls and all the stuff that Theater in the X does, it's like, how have I never seen them? They're so talented. Everybody's not 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 union, but they don't have to be. There's, there's union actors and non-union actors who are the same uh, skill level. But anyway, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's getting better. It, but there's still a lot of strides to be made, and especially, like I said, within the in the administration part too, you know. And I think the Wilma's trying to do that, in, and uh, you know, but some theaters aren't. Hmm. So, and I'm not going to name names; they know who they are. But um, no, I, 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 yeah, I mean, um, but it's it's it is getting better, Floyd. But there's still lots and lots of room for improvement. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, so I want to talk, talk about, about one of the most iconic, iconic shows, shows to ever hit the airwaves, The Wire. Oh, man. If you haven't, if you seen, haven't it, seen it, 
I don't know why not. It's, my it's echo not is um, echoing my sentiment. My sentiment. Oh. <laughs> It's this. It's not. It's not for everybody. I know many people. It's like I never seen. It. It's like, well, that's cool. You know what, Floyd? I didn't see all in these episodes. Some of the episodes that I was in, I didn't watch all every episode back to back until January of 2020, right before the pandemic. Because I was like, because wow. I, I hosted a thing for like a trivia night for the Wire, and these people were kicking my butt. They knew more than I. I was on the show, and they knew more than me. So I was like, I gotta watch every episode. And it was some. And the reality is. Sometimes I couldn't afford HBO, even though I was on an HBO show, and I I just didn't have it. And I was I'll be traveling, you know, doing theater or whatever. But um, yeah, I finally watched every episode, and I was like, damn, the show was really good. <laughs> but uh, and it was some stuff that I was in that I never even saw. So it was great to to finally watch all of it and just and I'm so blessed to be have a um, been you know I'm just a small part, but. And the actual reality is I was in 19 episodes, all five seasons, but um, I would have been probably in about 30 episodes, but I had a lot of theater conflicts um, because I wasn't a series regular. So Mm -hmm. they would contact me two weeks out and say, hey, we need you. And I'm like, I signed up for this play four months ago. Like I was in Indianapolis doing Intimate Apparel, a play, and they this was season four. They said, "Uh, hey, we, we we need you. This is a big it was the biggest story arc of my character, Detective Vernon Holly, and I was like, "I'm I'm here. I'm I'm out of town," and so what they did was I flew. I had to fly and on my own dime too. I had to pay mm. for my own plane and a hotel because I was a local hire hired by Pat Moran. I was not hired through my agent, um, so they didn't cover my travel. So I had to. I, I had a show, a uh, two o'clock show on Sunday. So I would I would fly out of Indianapolis uh, Sunday night, shoot on Monday, then have to get back to Indianapolis by 7 p.m. for my seven o'clock show on Tuesday, and I did that for three consecutive weeks. And actually, I lost money. I mean, I made it back with residuals and such, but I wanted to show, hey, I'm a team player, so I'm going to do this. So I did that for three weeks, and then um, that was the biggest. And that was some great scenes with Wendell that I I, I really love and cherish and um some of the best stuff that we did too but um but that's uh you know that's that's the reality of that but um but i just it, that was a lot of on the job training too and i know you i think um because how i got on uh, pat moran cast that locally in baltimore and how i got on her radar was i did the last the second to last episode of homicide life on the street good show and i yeah, great show. Um, I would love to work with Andre Brower, which I never did, but I was in this scene. I played a deaner, which is an assistant to the medical examiner, and my character was accused of stealing a watch. So I, I got this little part, and um, and so that's how I got on their radar. And so after that ended, uh, you know, that's David, another David Simon thing, The Wire happened. And um, so they had me in, I think, four times. They had me read for three different things, and the last thing... They had me read for the mayor, which went to Glenn Terman, which I think they just gave that to everybody to read just to see what they do with it. But um, the last thing I read for was the, Officer Holly, you know, det- uh, detective, homicide detective Vernon Holly. And, I, I, you know, I shot the episode. I thought it was just a one and done. And I don't know, somebody liked me and they brought me back. And, it, and, it, and then it started reoccurring. And then I, um, in the second season, my partner was the actual police commissioner of Baltimore. Like mm. he would come to set with bodyguards, you know, but something happened. He got involved with some type of scandal. And cause I was supposed to shoot two or three episodes and then they canceled it. And I never knew why. And then the very last episode of season two, they had my character in and I'm like, well, why are you having me here? You haven't seen my character for the whole season, but I didn't know that they had plans for me coming back, but nobody told me nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, I just was, so I was, you know, and I got there and I was so rusty and out of shape and uh, just out of TV shape. And uh, I was messing up my lines. I had like, like a, like a monologue to do about this cat getting killed. And, you know, Wendell Pierce was there and Wendell was, I just reminded him of this. He didn't remember this, but he just said, Hey man, just chill. You got this. He just reassured me just like a big brother. He was just, 
he was just so amazing, man. I learned so much from working with him and uh, and just his guidance. It just was invaluable. But he just calmed me and I, I was able to get through it. But, you know, but uh, yeah, I ended up doing 19 episodes and I'm a, a small a small cog in that, that, that big wheel of the, of the wire, which is one of the best, best, you know, I think one of the best TV shows. I mean, it's been said it's one of the top 10 TV shows ever, but it was just a, such a blessing, you know, a blessing and a, and they kind of, cause, cause I, I, I didn't come through a, an agency, you know, they, they, they did kind of treat you a little differently than they did, of course, the series regulars, but people, people who had agents, I knew one actor who, it was a pretty big act. I mean, pretty well known from Homicide, and and he 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 initially went through uh, local casting, but then he tried to get his agency involved. They wrote him off the show. So I was like, you know what? I'm keeping my mouth shut. I, I'll just stay where I'm. I'll stay in my lane. If you want to keep calling me in, because I because I was supposed to be in the first three episodes of the last season. Hmm. And um, I was playing a fellow at the time, so I told them I'm only off on Mondays, and they weren't going for that okie doke of the, the thing I did in Indianapolis. So, um, but as soon as I finished the fellow, I, I let them know, and then they had me back that that next week. So, hmm. um, but I was so 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 blessed to be a part of that, and just I learned so much and made you know made a couple of good friends too. That's beautiful. Uh, Chris Mann's here, and he said he uh, read for the mayor as well. Yes, Chris. Yup. Yup. Chris read for it. I think they had a bunch of us read for it. But yeah, Chris. Chris played Councilman Gray so beautifully. He he was uh, he was amazing in that. But I told Chris he he had more lines in one one episode than I did in five seasons. So yeah, my my because my my character would be I I would be bringing somebody coffee or some little one two line thing. But Chris, Chris was amazing on that show. Yeah, I was, I was really proud of him. Yeah, you guys, you, you guys did a phenomenal job. Um, it, it was just phenomenal to see the way that Philadelphia was was represented. Yes, yeah, a lot you know, of Philly talent up in that joint. A lot of Philadelphia talent, and that's why sometimes it pains you when you see a film shoot here. But then you don't see extremely talented Philadelphia actors in these films, or if they're in these films, the roles, I hate to say minor roles, because every role has, every role plays a part. They are minor roles sometimes. And, you know, Chris and I have talked about this many times, and it's like these producers they're, they're spending all this money. They're bringing people from L.A. or New York. Got to put them up, paying per diem. You have so, so many talented actors that are here, but the producers are like, oh, well, they're local. We can't use them. Or, you know, they, they have this kind of bias against us. And it's like, you know, Chris and I riff for stuff that ends up going to a rapper or somebody or, you know, somebody. I mean, hey, God bless them. But it's like, you know, rappers, I mean, whatever. I mean, there are some good rappers who are actors, obviously, but it's like I can't rap to save my life, so it's, it's like I stay in my lane, I stay away from that. But you know, they there's a bias against local talent sometimes, and I I found that out when I I did uh, I was just telling somebody I did an episode of um, the last episode of uh, this piece oh god, Bloodline, and. Um, and then that's it's funny because they, they brought me in from out of town and then I met some local actors there who were kind of saying the same thing that, that Chris and I do because we're local town. It's like, yeah, they, they you know, they could have they could have cast my role from somebody local, but they chose to bring me in, you know, which I was appreciated, appreciative of. But, you know, a lot of these producers, man, they, they, they kind of poo poo us. And it's like, you have you, you know, look at our work. It's not like we're 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 asking for something that we're not capable of, you know. But um, but it's their dime. If they want to spend, if they want to spend an extra twenty, thirty thousand. You you're throwing money away, but and you probably will get more people from Philly coming out to see the movie if you cast us in it. If you cast local people like that, I think that movie City of Brotherly Love. I ain't seen nobody from Philly in there. And it's like, come on, y'all, you know. But it's their money, it's their dime. They can do with it what they choose. But they're, they're, they're missing out. They're losing out. They really are. 
So, so what would you, because you've been in this business for a long time, what would you tell an actor just coming in or someone who's been here for a while, but they're getting a little frustrated with the way that the process is going because they don't think they're where they should be or need to be? What would you, what advice would you give them? I'd say, you know, I'm in business 35 plus years. I'm not where I should be either. But the thing is, I always tell younger actors, this this business is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, you know, and, and anytime you get a chance to perform, take it. I don't care if it's a staged reading, uh, if you, you know, doing somebody a favor and, and uh, if you're doing something in front of your family, read a poem, do it, you know, uh, do a monologue. Anytime you get a chance to perform, perform. Do student films. You can learn a lot from that. And and some of these student f- filmmakers are going to be the next Spielberg. You never know. So don't waste any opportunities to perform or to work on your craft. Um, when, and when you get um, sides or whatever, you know, sometimes save them and, and use them for, for practice. Be in a class. Uh, there's a... Um, a scene study class that I'm going to try to get to tonight. I don't know if I'll be able to, but now that I'm kind of laid up from the, the surgery, um, I'm going to try to do some online stuff too to just stay, you know, stay fresh. But always be working on your craft. Always be observing. Um, go see a foreign film. Go see a film that you can't understand the damn word that's being said, but you can understand inflections and and an eye raise or whatever. You know, um, go see theater, go see, go to the art museum, go see a a, a dance recital. I mean, immerse yourself in the arts. But I mean, you also have to live life because an actor who doesn't have a wealth of life experience is not going to be a very good actor, you know, and also um, and support people. I mean, I I think I have a good reputation in in the city of, of going out and supporting people. Because I, when, especially when I'm not in something, I mean, I've been lucky to blessed to be working steadily, but I love to see other actors and I learn from seeing other actors. If you want to be good, watch better, you know, go see somebody. You know, when I saw Wendell on, on Broadway, I was blown away. It was like, I can't do that, but I, I will aspire to do it. But and, and I worked with five people in that in that Broadway play. I worked with Andre De Shields and Wendell. Delaney Williams, um, Chris Davis, and uh, the brother of Mikael, who designed the sound. He was just nominated for a, uh, a Tony last year. But um, I don't. But I, I need to dream bigger. But I don't dream big. But but yeah, it's just it's just, it's about immersing yourself in the art. I mean, it, it is a craft. You know, learn it. You got to take class. You know, and I, I would say you know, even though stage is so, it takes up a lot of time. Um, and it doesn't pay as well, but get your butt on a stage too, when you can, it, it teaches you, it, it, you know, it's one of the best, you know, that's one thing I, I, I did study at Freedom Theater, but I, I learned my craft. Well, I shouldn't, I learned my craft at Freedom Theater, but I really kind of solidified my craft when at, at Bushfire Theater, when Al Simpkins gave me the opportunity to play these lead roles. We, we did a trilogy of August Wilson plays. That was my first introduction to August Wilson. Uh, Defenses, and I played Gabriel. And um, we had, uh, we put that up, and then we had 10 days in between to do the other. We did a trilogy, so we did Fences, then we did the piano lesson, which I played Boy Willie, and then we did um, Joe Turner's Come and Gone over the course of like two months. And that was this intense thing where we were rehearsing during the day, performing at night. And it was just, I was immersed in the world of August Wilson and I learned, learned so much. And, you know, and, and, and because with black theater, you know, a lot of times we don't have the resources that white theater has. So the first time we do a run through with costumes and lights and sound and everything is in front of a, you know, <laughs> in front of a, a, a rowdy August, a, a audience of 300 school kids. Like we did this play, uh, Bourbon at the Border, where I was playing this character called Tyrone. So I walk out, and then these kids start singing, you better call on Tyrone. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you got to laugh. 
but it's like you got to stay in character too but it's like it was you know i jokingly say it's trial by fire you know your first time doing the play with everything is in front of this you know, this, you, 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 you're skitsing out but you gotta you know you gotta focus and that's that's another thing i learned about what that was a great lesson in focus and concentration doing shakespeare in the park so especially in west philly with the trolleys going by and the people drumming dogs running on stage kids running on stage people shooting people smoking <laughs> weed you know that that will that will teach you some concentration and focus you know but it's it's a learning experience <laughs> so was that at 52nd and spruce uh around that well it's Malcolm X Park like 40 47 47th ish and pine around there it's right yeah that big that big you know I've done three shows there we just did Taming of the Shrew and Tamer Tame there and it's a great I mean it's a great space it's a great melting pot it's free you know it's people from all colors and uh sexual orientation and uh, every 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 everybody you want to see everybody's there and it's a beautiful thing and it's you know I'm sure I, I shouldn't say gunshots there were no gunshots but it's just a beautiful um collaboration of and and a conglomeration of, of all kinds of people together gathered to see the arts you know it's a beautiful thing so what's next what's next so um I have I'm doing this web series called stages that I play a mayor um <laughs> we shot one episode uh before my surgery and I have to shoot again on the 15th and the 21st then it's a, um, a, a uh, indie film called Kidnapped that I'm doing, playing a cop, uh, of uh, investigator in that. And then um, I guess I can announce that here. I'm doing radio golf at the Arden uh, Theater, and we start rehearsals at the end of February, and that's going to be my ninth of of the ten August Wilson uh, Century Cycle plays. So, good Lord willing. Um, I'll be able to do my Rainey's Black Bottom before I before I leave this earth, and that that way I will have done all ten of his plays. Which I mean, he's my favorite author. I've met him on a few occasions. He saw me play King Headley uh, at People's. Uh, I'm at uh, Philadelphia Theater Company years ago, and um, yeah, so uh, a web series and an indie indie film. I think it's actually two indie films. I think the other one is in New York. I'm still trying to figure out dates for that, and then the. Um, yeah, it was, uh, and then the uh, show at the Arden. Okay. Yep. And then I'm supposed to do a Shakespeare play at uh, at uh, the Lantern Theater, where I just did the, the Royale, which was an amazing experience um, with uh, Sahara McGill, and uh, who was just brilliant directing, and my boy Philip Brown from Freedom Theater, who was just amazing, phenomenal as a lead character. Hmm. So, um, but yeah, so just a couple of little things coming up, and then I have. Uh, couple of auditions to put on tape well one a uh, voiceover thing and another thing for an indie but I, again I don't have a, an agent right now so I got to um you know I'm gonna concentrate on getting better doing the things I got in front of me doing this theater and then reach out to this uh this manager about uh, representation because as I said if you want the the juicy stuff the the TV uh gigs and the you know and the, the things come uh the uh bigger um films you got to have an agent yeah. i do have yeah. another movie coming out called uh manadrome that i shot uh earlier this year and that's with uh jesse eisenberg and um uh yeah jesse eisenberg he's he's brilliant and very very nice young man and oh god i can't think of the other guy oscar <laughs> winner chris said where do you keep your clone because he said you all over the place. Chris said, "What do you keep your clone? Because you all over the place." Yeah, and he said, "Those nah, are cars backfiring on, on 52nd Street." <laughs> nah, I ain't all over the place. It seems like that, but I ain't. Because the reality is, and that's another thing I tell kids: it's like you fail more than you succeed. You know, I tell my daughter, who's uh, you know she's she's doing some little acting now, and it's like, yeah, daddy, daddy auditions for ten things and maybe get may get one. Or may get none, you know. I, I had a point right before the pandemic. I was O for 2018 and 19 in mm. New York auditions, in-person auditions. Didn't book anything, but I booked some TV shows and a couple few movies from self tapes. 
before the whole self tapes thing started with the after the pandemic. So I had a little heads up on that. But um, but yeah, the the, the rally is yeah. I fail mo most of the time, and um, but I'm blessed to keep doing what I love for a living, as meager as it is sometimes. And I'm blessed that I have a wife who's a professor who ha who's the main breadwinner <laughs> because we be we be uh sitting outside the, of the Donald's eating scraps if we had to depend on my income. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm blessed to do what I love for a living, and uh. And I thank God for that. I thank my family for their support. And, um, you know, I'm just blessed to, uh, to, to, you know, to have found the love of, of what, I, what, what I wanted to do. I mean, if I had known about it earlier, it would have been nice to go into a, a performing, arts high, performing arts high school or, or to have gotten a degree or whatever. But that wasn't my path. But not that I poo-poo that. I... I I certainly would encourage people to, you know, get a degree, study, you know, this is a craft. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily have to, you know, go to a four, four year college, but there's plenty of uh, places to take classes at plenty of great, great, great teachers out there. One of the greatest teachers I had for film and TV was Jonathan Strauss, who, who I, I, I took a class with him. I learned so much. He ended up casting me in two law and order SVUs and, mm. um, and a movie which was, uh, you know, um, See You in September, which is, I, had, I played a cop in a scene with Whoopi Goldberg and a bunch of other people. Just a small little part, but I learned a lot. And that was from taking the class with him in New York. So. Well, Mr. Wilson, this has been absolutely amazing. Echo and all. <laughs> I can't hear no echo. I can hear it, but it is what it is. Uh, and uh, I just like to thank the audience those of you who uh, hung out with us for the last hour and 15 minutes, I truly apologize for that echo. We're going to try to figure out why that is happening and fix that for the uh, next episode. But before we go, Chris said we came up on the rough side of the mountain, but if it wasn't rough, we couldn't climb it. Hey, True amen. words. Happy New Year, C-Man. That's, that's my boy. True words. True words. Two two phenomenal actors. One I'm interviewing and the other one that I've interviewed. And it's just a blessing to actually to know these brothers. It, it truly is. It is a blessing uh, that I do not uh, take lightly. But Brian. It's a blessing knowing you. And we we, we should we got to mention Compromise, the joint that we did with you. That oh, yeah. Brilliant. That was a brilliant piece. Gritty, urban thriller. I mean. It, it, it was it was some scary stuff in that in that joint, man. I love yeah, that I, I, that was a that was a good movie, and you you uh really you, you did your you did your thing. And our boy Nakia, yeah, Nakia wow, was a beast in that. Yeah, you man. know what? We're gonna have to get all. And I said this to Nakia when I had Nakia on a couple of months ago. I'm gonna have to get all three of you guys on this podcast together. Yes. So we so we can so we can we gotta do it. So we could, we could, we could have that Philly connection thing, but I'm not I'm not going to keep you any longer, Brian. I truly appreciate you stopping through tonight. Uh, I hope that everyone that was listening and will be listening will definitely internalize a lot of these gems that he's dropped about this business. It's a phenomenal business. It's not always pretty, but we love it. We know it going in. And uh, again, Brian, thank you so much for for being here. I can't wait to uh, have you back along with Chris and Nakia. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to a conversation with. And as I always like to say when I'm uh, ending this show, love this like a hobby, but treat it like a business. Amen. And on that note, everyone have a phenomenal night. Take care.